opportunities during the week to walk through the village and the surrounding areas. Sorry. It's quite a humbling experience walking through a small village like this when you're the only white people for hundreds of miles. Um, you get a lot of stares, and the children call out um, munguzus, which we thought meant white people. And Sue's research later on in the week told us that um, this actually means people who walk around in circles. <laughs> They greet you with John Mo, which means hello, and also Karibu, which just means you are welcome, or Karibu Sante, which you are very welcome. So, and every place did that, so it was a very welcoming place. Um, one of our walks took us, took us past the village water pump, which I think was in the previous slide. Yeah. And those were two girls that were sort of giggling because we were trying to take their pictures. Um, and they um, collect water in those five gallon buckets, and then they, with the use of a banana, dried banana leaves, they put a crown on their head and then carry the buckets on top of their heads for great distances. Uh, we had running water and flush toilets in our guest house, but it was just cold water. Um, every night one of, after the cooks were done making our dinner, they would heat the water, and then they would carry a, uh, one of these five gallon buckets of warm water for us to take sponge baths and to wash our hair. <clears throat> Unlike car homes in the U.S., um, there are very few TVs, computers, video games. So much of their days are spent in community, outside in their yards, in their stores, working in the fields, or tending small herds of cattle and goats. Even the youngest children, ages three, you'll see them out tending herds of uh, cattle and goats. And the adults <laughs> have their own responsibilities with their jobs and uh, with their homes. People tend to commune at the local shops in these small towns, the small town in Kungi Village. Most of the homes were, were mud brick, and you saw some of the pictures there. Uh, the children were very, very curious and would come out and, and want to uh, talk of you, know, walk with you. They can't talk with you, but walk with you or play games. And that wheel that you saw um, the, was the universal toy, especially for the boys. They would be hitting this wheel. The bicycle was the main mode of transportation. So there are a lot of spare tires for them. That's what they used to play with. Anything becomes a toy. Um, students at the school, the secondary school anyways, come from long distances and they, they, they tend to live there in dormitory arrangements. And uh, so then they have to actually bring their own food and bring big bags of corn with them. And the corn is their meal. Uh, we got to see through the, uh, the kids session was just beginning, the semester, I guess you'd say, was just beginning, and so the kids were hauling big loads of corn to the mill to be, uh, to be milled. Uh, and this is where they, they were provided. This is the kitchen at the secondary school where the kids' uh, meals were cooked. Uh, even Pastor Vern had the opportunity to help <laughs> Reverend Manasa with his chores, and this is milking Reverend Manasa's back in the Yambi Hospital. Um, families are expected to provide meals for their families that were patients there. And this is a, a kitchen that's on the grounds of the Yambi Hospital. And then one of our walks took us through um, many backyards as we wound our way through Nkumi Village um, to the secondary school that was um, in, in that village. Um, as we went along, Sue and Vern and Steve and I were quite the attraction for the local children. I felt like we were Pied Pipers because they just kept trickling out of the yards and coming and grabbing onto our hands and just we kept getting more and more. Um, and you'll see other pictures where we um, have, they wanted to see their photos. So Vern would take a picture and then he'd have to show the picture to all the kids. So that was really good.
cutest thing, and Shelly wanted to teach her how to play patty cakes. <laughs> expected and uh, we showed up and they showed us incredible hospitality in a short amount of time and by the next morning they well we had a little gathering uh, and they had a plan and they were going to show us around and as Craig talked about they gave us a tour and then the next day they were going to have us go deeper and connect with people and you'll hear more about that but I can't say enough about how quickly they worked to make us welcome we just said over and over again, this might not be exactly the welcome we provide, but probably far better. Probably far richer, far better, far deeper, because they see that as such an important part of their culture, and so very important to welcome people in Jesus' name. And so we, we had about three or four kind of confabs where we got everybody together, and we started talking about 
while we were there. And Hillary, you, you saw him earlier, the nurse anesthetist and Reverend Manasseh and others would gather with us. And they were just kind of scratching their head the first day. Um, and, and they were asking questions like, why are you here? Who sent you? Because they didn't know we were coming. Uh, that's the hospital director's problem at fault, in my opinion. But uh, that's what happens sometimes when communication can break down. Why are you here? Who sent you? And um, finally, they asked that question enough. I just kind of paused and said, God? <laughs> and that seemed like a good answer. And I didn't, mean, I didn't mean it in jest, but it just seemed like we had such a had such a topsy-turvy way of trying to connect with them at the very beginning that it was, okay, let's, let's put God in the middle of this. And it's amazing, when I said God, how important that became for them and for us. God sent us. God sent us to you. Um, and they took that completely seriously. And I think the more we said it, the more seriously we took it too. And I think one of the ways that we started to live that out is the hospital workers every morning would have chapel, and we would gather with them for worship, and sometimes they translate some things, and sometimes they wouldn't, but music was always a part of what they did, and music and worship became a way for us to connect in ways that maybe we hadn't connected before, and I think you could say, in effect, that they created a place for us to worship. We wanted to have some close ups of that because we want our choir to do that more. So, especially that shepherd choir. We were too good at that if they practice a little. Anyway, the worship, the, the meetings we had, the God thing really pulled us together. And now Sue's going to talk about how we started to go deeper after some of these things happened.